So tonight we're doing something a little bit different um, with the presenters. We've got two completely different presenters, which we haven't done before. Um, I was approached by Norm um, about the kayaking trip that he's organizing to, where is it? Turkey. Turkey, Turkey thank you. So. Um, and I also had talked to uh, Bob and Elizabeth about their experiences up on the uh, river, the Coppermine, yeah. Coppermine River. Um, and I know a little bit about it, and it was uh, a pretty intense experience. So um, Norm's going to lead off, and he's going to um, introduce Kamel, who's going to uh, talk about kayaking in uh, Turkey. Norm? Set this up. Okay. So while Fred is uh, playing with the computer here, um, so on my left is Kamal. Kamal moved to Victoria from Turkey um, about four, almost five years ago. Uh, he's a computer engineer, so he's got a day job, so he doesn't do the weekly paddles, but he paddles on weekends. Anyhow, at the uh, Siska picnic in uh, September, uh, Vic and I and Pat Hill, who had signed up for this uh, trip, kayaking trip to Turkey, were chatting, and Kamal spotted us and came over and introduced himself and said, oh, I'm from Turkey. I've kayaked in all those areas. And of course, none of us have ever been there. We can only imagine what it might be like. So I asked Kamal, would he, uh, come and uh, if we had a little session uh, for those that are interested in going to Turkey, would he be prepared to show some slides and uh, give us an idea of what it's like? Well, that morphed into what we're doing tonight. Rather than a, a session prior to the meeting, uh, Kamal has put together a slideshow. Um, so before uh, we start, um, the, the trip is organized by Exodus, and uh, I have no vested interest in Exodus at all, except I have traveled with this company before, and they organize good trips. And other people in the club have also had positive experiences. Lynn has uh, just put her hand up. So yeah, they're, they're a good company. Um, the trip is in June, uh, the first week of June next year. And um, a number of us have signed up for other trips while we're there, because it's a long way to go just for uh, a week of kayaking. But interesting, the cost for the week of kayaking is about the same as going to the Broken Group for a week. You just have to add your airfare. But, so it's about $3,000 for uh, a week of kayaking. All transportation accommodation is included. And it's not camping, because I don't go camping. <laughs> it's in uh, proper uh, hotels and inns and so on. Um, now, I think I'll let uh, Kamel tell us a little about uh, what it's like to kayak in Turkey, and then uh, at the end, I know he has a slide that will show the area that uh, we'll be traveling in on this trip. And I also have a table set up at the back, and uh, anyone who wants more information about it, come and see me, and if I'm not there, just write your name and phone number, email on the list, and uh, I can send you information later if you want to know more about the trip. Okay, so this is Kamel. Over to you. Hey, good. Let me go on. Thank you for the introduction, Norm. Uh, yeah, as he said, uh, he asked me if I would like to give a presentation about kayaking in Turkey. I said, yeah. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. So uh, I'm Kemal Tondor, original from Turkey. Uh, I've been living here for almost five years, as Norm said, so with my family. So yeah, he already said, I'm a computer engineer, mostly developing software, not computer engineering, I'm not doing computer engineering and software development. Uh, I got my master's degree uh, in business from Royal Roads a couple of years ago, and right now I'm working as a soft senior software developer at BC campus. Uh, Although I've been paddling since I've been, I was five or six, so I consider myself beginner, 
because uh, up here it's how you guys approaching the paddling is completely in a different level compared to Turkey. So it's we all recreational. We are not doing anything. So no one has their own kayak in Turkey. Most of us living in apartments and things. So it's, it's completely different thing. So so I decided to join the Siska also uh, to VCKC because I'm living in Rio Royal. So after I realizing that probably the kayaking is the best thing to do in Victoria. After realize, so after realizing that it's, uh, my adaptation to swimming in the cold water is, hadn't been progressing for a while, so I decided, <laughs> oh, okay, probably just it's time to do something else. Oh, and yeah, uh, before moving on, uh, with the gratitude, I'd like to acknowledge that my family and I uh, live, work, learn, and grow on the land of Lukongan speaking people, the uh, Songhees nation, and Eskum Alt nation's lands. So, okay, uh, the outline of uh, today's talk will be uh, I will briefly talk about the geographic context of the presentation because Turkey is a pretty long, uh, pretty big country. I'll talk about weather tides, currents. There is none. So, it's <laughs> <laughs> so and then uh, briefly talk about the region and the history of the region, uh, because I like to show you it's not about paddling. That part of the Turkey is uh, worth to go for trekking or just visiting, in addition to uh, paddling over there. So, in case, so here's the Turkey. Uh, on the south, uh, we have Mediterranean Sea, and then on the north, the Black Sea. Uh, I'll talk about the Antalya. Antalya is my hometown, by the way, so the, some of you will visit my hometown next year. So Antalya city center is here, and then its whole region con uh, called is Antalya province. And this small part uh, covers the Karsh and Piakova region. And most of my uh, kayaking experience uh, happened in this red area, and then oh, that area actually called Kashkekova region. And the next year's trip uh, will spend at least four or five days in that region also. So about the weather, as you expect, it's pretty warmer there. So in the summertime, it averaged around 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, but it's just one part of the equation. Actually, humidity is the main problem in Antalya. Uh, uh, if you can see here, I just forget. So there is this Taurus Mountain series that covers or protects the Antalya. So what happens? Uh, hot and humid air, the mountain, uh, uh, Taurus Mountain series just holds and traps that hot air and warm air, uh, humid air. And then most of the time in the summer times, it's just over the 80 or 85 uh, percent of humidity. And then when it gets dry, it gets hotter because it means it's blowing from north, that all that dry, hot air coming from the northern side of the Antalya, and then probably you will feel like you are living in an air fryer. That's <laughs> that kind of feeling. So, so best, best, yeah. If you want to go there, just avoid July and August. The, the best term. I think of my favorite time of the year is just mid September to October. Just great, early May to early uh, June. That's great time. So, as I said, uh, so I don't have any memory about thinking or worrying about the tides and currents in Antalya, but in case maybe I'm wrong, I did some research and yeah, there's no tides in Mediterranean <laughs> Sea, so it's nothing to worry about, it's just... Okay. And then currents, maybe there are some currents on the open sea, but there isn't any 
current uh, class of land. And OK, that's a bonus. Uh, the water temperature from the last, last weekend is just a couple days ago. So I, I'm just living how it's like in summer over there. So no wetsuits, no dry suits. You don't need anything. So. And probably you understand why I'm struggling to swim here. <laughs> <laughs> OK, brief history. Uh, this is uh, Kash Amphitheater, by the way. So it's in central Kash. So the southern part of Turkey uh, kind of treasure trove of uh, archaeological sites. Um, you, you will be able to see all the remnants of these great uh, civilizations. Lycians, Roman Empire, Byzantine, Seljuk, and Ottoman Empire, but mostly you will see uh, Lycian civilizations, cities, uh, tom tombs, rock carved monuments, all of them. So it's a great place. Uh, as I said, uh, the Lycian civilization is the main uh, ancient, uh, has a main ancient site, and the Lycian Way is kind of ancient road. It's about 550 kilometers, connects all the Lycian cities. And as you can see, it's most part of it is close to shoreline. So you are able to paddle, trek, do some trekking, stay somewhere. We used to actually backpacking, stop somewhere, Paddle a couple days, just rent paddling, and then we were uh, we were able to jump somewhere else on foot, and then paddle. Maybe it a, it's great a uh, way to spend your time on on Talia. So the, the same thing is uh, Lycian sites. I just want to show you. Uh, so the the purple circles are the first degree conservations area. So all these things are ancient sites, pretty well preserved. And this is the Kekowa Kash region. So, and I'll show a couple of pictures from some uh, Lycian cities. Fasilis, it's my, one of my favorite places. It's pretty close to Antalya. It's not so close to Kash. But it has two publicly accessible beaches. So you can go and swim right over here and some where of, so you can see that's ancient path to the beach. Uh, Santos, one of my favorite place, uh, and actually my probably my favorite place is Mira. It's just 45 minutes away from the Kash, and uh, as I said, it's monuments or rock carved monuments are just great. It's same place Mira. Uh, and my wife and cousin is just so excited to move on to slideshows. So, okay, for well, paddling. So as I said, uh, the name of this place, by the way, is Uchos, not, it, it's something different here. So the usual day trips uh, follow, uh, starts from the Uchos and ends in Uchos. So, and then this uh, solid purple line is general route of the day trips around there. And I know uh, there are some trips or if you have your own or if it's a private tour or guided or if you are uh, doing it by yourself, you can take this uh, extra routes and things. And also there's this uh, long trip so, so you can start from the Kosh, camp here, then jump to the next location, you can come here. And, and by the way, there are accommodations over there. Norm, you don't need to <laughs> sleep in the tent. And then, yeah, so you can go to Uchos and then jump to the uh, Demre. It's called Demre, but this Mira is just over here, the, the ancient sites. Can I ask a question? Sorry? Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. What would the distance be between those um, red um, triangles? Okay. Uh, the campsites? The, the longest one is this one, if I, and it's 18 kilometers. Okay, so it's, it's just it's three or four hours pedaling every day, probably, and it's just four day tour. So it's, I, and also uh, there, there are other parts of uh, 
this uh, southern part of the Turkey and it's, uh, it's you need to go the northern side so there are other great places to pedal but as I said this is my hometown and I spent most of my time <laughs> around this area so uh, okay so this is Uchels. Uh it's a small coastal village uh, was built on the an uh, ancient Lycian city it's called uh, let me take Temusa, which also means Uchels, which means three mouth. So, because of, yeah, if you realize, so they call this is the Uchels, so because there's three entrance, they call it three mouth or Temusa. So, Uchels means three mouth in Turkish. So, small village, mostly uh, fishermen and so touristy places and the restaurants. It's great small town. Uh, as I said, it's built on top of the old ancient city. So you can see uh, this house has adjacent uh, uh, ancient <laughs> city wall just next to its house. I probably it's passing it. So uh, yeah, the, the, the day starts from Uchelos to Tarsana Bay. Uh, Tarsana means, uh, Tarsana means shipyard. So it's, it's a small, uh, small bay we are giving uh, Half an hour to one hour stop here is taking some snacks. Uh, it's a very popular place, so lots of uh, kayakers stop stuff, lots of tour guides. And we don't have ice cream trucks in Turkey, but we have ice cream boats there, so <laughs> it's a good treat. Uh, uh, if you take a guided tour, most of them uh, follow you with uh, support boats and things to carry your stuff and other things. Oh, and yeah, uh, this is the cutting edge underwater exploration device <laughs> here. So he's checking the device. So, because the next stop is sunken city. So, and you are not allowed to dive, swim, do anything. And the kayaking is the only way to get that close to that uh, archaeological sites. Uh, so, uh, some tours or tour guides brings this. Uh, super cool technology with them <laughs> so you can look down. So yeah, so you have to get some briefing before heading to Sunken City because all the archaeological side you shouldn't jump into the water, you shouldn't try to land or do anything so it's all kind of stuff so uh, you're getting some briefing and also some history lessons from your guides. And then everyone is just heading to the sunken state. It's a little bit darker, but it starts from here. So little uh, window from all times uh, goes smooth. As I said, it's, you can see the uh, ruins of the old house under the sea and all the walls and stairs and everything here, the same. A different angle, different year probably. I, I went there a couple times, so uh, there are a couple different uh, photographs and things. Uh, the stairs, uh, the, as I said, it's houses just right now and under the sea. There are the more of it, so if you have that cutting edge technology, you are able to look under it and you, you will be able to see some amphoras and things if no one took them, so. How did it get uh, The thing is, earthquakes, uh, raising sea levels, and if i not wrong, it's some other tectonic movements other than the earthquakes, so cause that. Sunken city. So it's yeah. This is the biggest part, I guess, to see easily. So you can see this uh, walls under the sea. It goes all the way down towards to uh, land. And here is the wall walls of the old city. And as we are talking about to uh, to two hundred. BC or 300 BC or that time that sunken and Lycian civilization lived from 15th century BC to 
two or three century AD. So it's, yeah, it's, they reign, of course, as the uh, Roman Empire uh, <laughs> conquered them, but anyway. So yeah, it's a couple days, and the water was always clean, it's always warm over there. So yeah, that's a good example of the sunken city. You are able to see the roof lines of the old houses still and house things. It's, it's an amazing place, so you, you have to experience it. Uh, and this is, if my memory serves me right, I've been told this is all toilet. <laughs> so maybe my guy was just messing with me, but <laughs> I don't know. Uh, my wife and cousin is just enjoying. So yeah, this is the second time because the first, when we went there the first time, uh, my wife and I took the tandem, and then I, next year I decided to ditch her with <laughs> <laughs> my cousin. So, uh, anyway, so yeah, the next stop is uh, Kalekiri. It's also the uh, ancient name is Smena. So uh, there's a Smena castle and uh, all the ruins. Uh, that's the famous tomb in this sea. So in this Smena, so Smena castle and the tomb. So it's pretty famous. Probably you will see this tomb, um, lots of postcards and things. If you go there, it's famous, so. Could zoom in? Could, I don't remember, <laughs> but yeah. But this guy is talking about it right now, so. <laughs> and uh, giving some information about the, uh, the village and how to do what to do with this kind of things. Uh, the character is Smena is just great village. There's no uh, <coughs> land access. You have to go there by sea, either boat or kayak. It was like that at least five years ago. Uh, so it's pretty well preserved uh, because they have they can't build anything anymore. So it's it has to stay. I don't even know how they were able to build build all these things over the other. <laughs> Uh, ruins of the thing. So uh, most of those house uh, foundation is the old ancient walls or things. It's so crazy. And then you, you are able to walk up to the castle and uh, watch the area. So as I said, that's a pretty uh, busy place. So with lots of characters just comes and goes and lots of uh, tour walks. Um, yeah, same place. Oh, I'm trying. As I said, there are lots of other bays around the Kalekiri Semana and that part of it. And then water is just great, uh, so you can stop for swimming and do other stuff. So small villages and other than the Kalekiri, as I said, it's a great place to go kayak and walk and do lots of other activities. So it's, yeah, we are heading back to uh, Uchos. So we have small rock gardens over there, if it's your thing. <laughs> now, uh, just and a long way is, it's again, it's Tiam Musa, the ancient city or ancient name of the Uchos. So while you're approaching the Uchos, you, you are able to see it's just next to. And then uh, Lishim Way just goes up here and then, then curls into the land and actually I have a slide, yeah. And then this is the next day we decided to walk on the Lishan Way and then we up, we reached the same place from the land. So we were here in the previous thing. So it's a great place, as I said. Uh, yeah, it's the Uchos, we are approaching the Uchos. And yeah, probably this is the highest way land you will get. So it's, <laughs> it's not that bad in that area and then if you check the weather, you will just know it's, if it, if it will get rough, people will let you know. But most of the time, in the summer times, it doesn't get rough. So it's just a great place to paddle. <laughs> but it's just hot a little bit, just be careful. <laughs> and then end of the day, though, we reached each other's. Okay, yeah, thank you for your attention. It's was my pleasure. Uh, yeah.
I don't have any social media anymore, but if you really want to sh use social media, you can uh, reach me from the li my LinkedIn account or just you can send me an email. Uh, yeah. Or else put your name on the list at the back and uh, we can get yeah. in touch with you. Yeah. So, Norm, is this the same place that you're going to be going yes. on your trip? Yes. Yeah. Uh, he, he has a slide here this showing. So, we're, we're going to fly to Istanbul and then we have to get away from Istanbul down to Dalaman and that's about an hour and a half flight. So this is that south west corner of Turkey on the Mediterranean and so our trip starts at Gocek and we're there for about three nights doing uh, day trips around Gocek, staying on a lovely hotel. <laughs> then we're bussed two and a half hours or so down here to Jakova and to the area that Kamal just showed you. Uh, I think you chose now. And we'll be staying in a village there. Could be the one that he mentioned, yeah. Czech or something like that. And uh, we're there for two or three days. And then we end up in Kaj, and we're there for two or three days. And then that's the end of uh, the trip. And then we are bused back to Dalman Airport, and then we go to wherever our next destination is. So that's the trip. I've got to mention that they've got a Black Friday sale on at the moment. So the, all their trips, not this one, everything else, Exodus is doing is 20% off <coughs> until I think the end of the month. Is that right, Rick? End of November? Thanks, Kamal. That's great. Thank you. So thanks for having me. I normally have to bribe family and friends with dinner and drinks to get them to look at my pictures. So <laughs> it's a change to have people voluntarily come. <laughs> so Bob and I lived in northern BC for 15, 20, well actually over 20 years before we moved to Victoria. So when we lived in the north we were, we did a lot of canoeing. And part of that time we talked about wanting to canoe a river that went to the Arctic. And actually, we've been talking about it since 1988. So finally, this summer, we decided to make it happen. So after sort of investigating, doing it ourselves or with friends and everything, it just didn't work out. So we ended up going, uh, organizing this canoe trip through um, Canoe North Adventures, which is a um, company in Ontario and Fort Norman based out of there. Um, yeah, so after much debate, we settled on the copper mine and we had our two week guided trip um, at the end of August. So the trip starts. Um, I didn't quite. Okay, so we, we start, it's okay. Yep. Um, starts by, off by flying into Yellowknife, and we had two nights in Yellowknife, and Challenges started right away. Um, unfortunately, WestJet was unable to deliver me my bag. So we spent our free day in Yellowknife repurchasing everything. And Bob, actually, they also lost his gate check bag, so he had to buy a few things too. So but the trip got off to a bit of a bad start right away. Um, it was also a little bit smoky when we got there. It wasn't too bad. This is a view from the old part of town looking up towards the new part of town. And Yellowknife is there on the, let me, ah. <laughs> sorry, the north shore of Great Slave Lake. And the Coppermine River starts up in these lakes here. And we can see it a little bit better on the next slide here. Um, so these um, blue dots are the from my inReach map and the blue dots along the river here are all of our campsites because I post a thing every night. So we started down this area and followed all the way up to there and this was our first flight. Took us in on these big planes. There was two of them each holding 70 passengers. There was 10 canoers and 60, 60 um, fishermen. And we landed at this um, fishing lodge on Great Bear Lake. 
um, called Plumber's Great Bear Lake Lodge. And all those boats were off fishing within half an hour of his landing. <laughs> but us canoers um, subsequently just had to change planes. So changing planes involved um, getting the canoes organized. So there was two canoes nested inside each other on one side and one on the other side. And each trip could take six passengers and all the gear. So there was two trips out to the river and the float plane. And there's the float plane taking off with the first one. And looking down at the Great Bear Lake Lodge, and um, you can see the big runway over there in the back that the big planes landed on. Oops. And this is our campsite for the first night when we landed on the river. Um, the, canoe, the canoe company provides all the tents and the canoes. You can take a lot of gear in a canoe. They give us these big barrels to put your stuff in, so they're waterproof. We had things in dry bags, but we never got any water in them. Um, lots of kitchen gear, as well as our own personal ones. There would be a couple for the kitchen. And, um, so you can put a lot more stuff in a canoe than you can put in a kayak, that's for sure. And you just toss it in. No, no, pretty easy loading. And big tents, like four-person tents, they were quite heavy. We had big chairs to sit in, like none of the little things. <laughs> so this is the best of the group pictures that I got. We never did manage to get a full group picture. Um, two of them, this fellow, he was an American. He was an American physician. This guy's from Australia. The rest of us were Canadian. Bob and I are from BC, and the rest of them are all from Ontario. Um, there's only nine of the 10 clients there. Um, there was one client at back at camp sick. So that was the start, <laughs> the start of the next adventure. Um, this is his wife, she was sitting there. She was also sick, but not very sick, so she continued to do things. She wasn't so sick, she had to be in the tent. And this is their son, and he was the youngster on the trip, and we're gonna show a movie that he, he made um, in a little bit. And this is getting ready for our first day on the water. And there's a little bit of smoke today, but this is like the last that we're going to see of smoke. And uh, we all had um, spray decks on the canoes to keep things dry. We had, I guess, probably each canoe had two of those barrels and then one other kitchen barrel or something like that, as well as other stuff in the backs of the kayaks. Um, great big propane tanks. We're not talking those little things. I mean, <laughs> not the full-size propane tanks. I don't know how many stoves we had, but lots. These canoes were really heavy. You don't have to carry water, though. Um, so anyway, this is us actually starting off on our first day. And as I said, the canoes were really heavy. And so we had headwinds and blowing sand for the first several days, made for some really tough paddling. And those, yeah, um, blowing sand. Did you say these ones start on their own? I oh, there we go. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of thing that we're looking at. <laughs> so it was really cold and rainy a lot of the time, so Matt was really into making these great big fires at lunchtime, which we all really appreciated because you could dry out and warm up. And <laughs> <laughs> What a miserable lot we were this day. <laughs> and I remember it so well because it was like about day two of getting COVID. And all I wanted to do was just curl up by that fire and stay there. <laughs> and dry suits or wet suits were advised, but I don't know, those Ontario guys didn't seem to get that memo, so they were just wearing their regular clothes underneath rain gear, so they weren't particularly happy with their choice, I don't think. <laughs> Oh, it's actually, it's a video. It doesn't want to play, whatever. Um, yeah, and just, you know, another fire. Yeah, and we had two rest days. One of them was a really good hike. How do I get it to play? But it was really windy and rainy. And anyway, Matt was taking this because his phone was broken, so he took it with my phone. So we just hiked up the hill and had a good look down over the river, so this was the day that the first fellow was 
sick in his tent with COVID. And there was lots of blueberries, so we picked blueberries. And this was our second rest day. So there was only two out of our 14 days. So I guess this was the only day that there wasn't wind. So the mosquito nets came out. And um, anyway, Bob, Bob's hat's in his chair, but he's actually sick in bed this day. I was starting to get better from COVID, but now Bob is sick in the tent. So he had a rest day with his COVID though. And there was very little evidence of civilization or we didn't see any other people or anything during our two weeks there. So we stopped to check out these cabins one day and lo and behold, <laughs> oops, go back here. Keep hitting my, John Abercrombie. <laughs> he paddled the river in 1989. I don't think John's here though, but I did send him the picture to <laughs> proof that he was still in existence out on the copper mine. And we also walked up to see this um, old cabin was from Samuel Hearn, one of the very first um, white people to go down the Copper Mine River back in the 1700s. Actually, I think it was 1771. And that cabin is still in that good of a shape. Um, I guess it's just frozen all winter. And we had some great food on the trip. There's, you saw the, in the movie they had a um, Dutch oven that they would put on top of that firebox. So they did a lot of baking over the firebox. Anyway, here was blueberry cake, chocolate cake. Here's those the Matt's, um, uh, no, Connor's cinnamon buns. He slept with the dough at the foot of his sleeping bag all night so that they would rise. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know, if, you know those Tim Tam cookies? So do, uh, does this generation know what Tim Tam Slams are? As soon as I mention them to my kids, they go, oh yeah, Tim Tam Slams. Anyway, you take a little bite out of the corner, opposite corners of one of those Tim Tam cookies, and then you do this. How long do you have to wait for It's hot chocolate in its cup. It's really good. <laughs> so those are Tim Tam Slams. <laughs> so we did see some wildlife and you saw some pictures of the muskox. This was actually another day that we saw muskox. Um, they were just grazing there on the side of the river and we just floated by and they paid like no attention to us. They just kept on munching. And we did see caribou on a few occasions, um, usually just a group of sort of two to six of them, and you did see some of them there in the movie, but um, it was never good enough with my camera, so this is pictures of the guys taking pictures of the caribou. And <laughs> yeah, that's about as close as I got to a caribou. I found those antlers one day. And there's that infamous happy hour. Um, so that is quite a big tradition within the um, canoe company that everybody brings one. And I also like their Hand, sanded, hand washing station with the paddles and um, the, a bag full of water and soap, so right beside the kitchen. So everybody, there was no excuse not to wash your hands before you were in the kitchen. So the fishermen did get to practice their technique on a couple of days, and this was the most successful one. And there, there was that, that was in the movie too, Nicholas taking pictures of Adam with his um, first Arctic char. And that, Matt was really happy with his catch taken on the fly that day. He'd never caught one that big on a fly before, so he was pretty excited. And again, this was happy hour on that day, and we had a lot of fish for happy hour. So these adventure mugs are also a big tradition within the company. They come along on every trip, and they all have a different um, little animal of some kind on them. And everybody has their own. They're all different. And then you get to keep them at the end of the trip. And finally, so it was a week of slogging on that flat water. We finally get to the first um, moving water day. This is called Rocky Defile. It's this big canyon. Everybody's worried about Rocky Defile. Anyway, on the river, there's several sets of big canyons that you get out and you scout them. Um, and this was the day that I was feeling really sick. So I just kind of hid between some rocks and Bob took the camera and took the pictures. And anyway, I had a nap while they were scouting. That was the top of the canyon, and this is the bottom end of the canyon. 
or actually it's the other way around. This is the beginning and the other picture was around the corner. So in between the canyons, there's, um, there's areas they call them swifts where the water is just moving rapidly and there's lots of rocks and have to decide which channel to take and braided areas and that kind of thing. And then, so sometimes picking the best channel is difficult and you know Matt would stand up in the canoe and try and scout ahead to where we should go. And this is scouting muskox rapids. That's the bottom part of them. So this is a bit out of focus here but um, I left it in anyway just to, because this is the only one I have of any moving water. So this was actually Connor and um, Nicholas going down ahead. So that's what he would go down ahead during some of these rapids and then he'd launch his drone and take pictures of us coming through. So as the, the, the bow person usually just kind of paddles like mad, the stern person is kind of deciding on the route as they go through, and then the bow person, if they're going to hit a rock, you do some maneuvers to miss the rock and hope that the bow person, the stern person, follows through. <laughs> so he's going to do a cross bow draw as he gets to the other side there. And telling us to get going so he would we would by the time we got to the canoes he'd have the drone up and taking pictures of us coming through question yeah i noticed in some of the earlier pictures and it looked like on that one too that the stern paddler didn't have the spray skirt tied down was that standard it was up to you whether or not you wanted to they didn't i guess they don't really like them so much in the back because it's hard to get out when those are in right. and if you have to get out in a hurry um it makes it more awkward so it was, it was our choice which you wanted to do. I kept my eye. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't get out in a hurry. <laughs> I was a good camper. Yeah. This is a campsite at the bottom of Sandstone Rapids. So this was the start of a very long day. And this is just going down another swift area along some beautiful cliffs. I think that was in his video too. And we had a short stop to check out this absolutely amazing waterfall and pool. Those with dry suits jumped in. They, People that didn't have dry suits were regretting it, but um, we'd only later. I mean, we stopped here for about 20 minutes. We could have spent a couple hours. We'd only find out later why it was so short. And here we are. This is the final set of the runnable rapids called Escape Rapids. So we're scouting them again. And there's two canoes at the bottom coming down the bottom. Um, yeah, I think there was some video of us going through escape rapids. The one that looked the, the hairiest was, I think, at the bottom of this escape rapids. And so shortly after getting through there, we're paddling along, and somebody commented, I think I got more water in my boat than I should. So sure enough, they put a hole in their boat, so that got fixed. And it was at this point that Matt also kind of said, it was about 5 o'clock. Matt goes, I've got some good news and some bad news. And I don't know what the good news was, I don't remember, but the bad news was we had to be in Kaguakstep by nine, by nine o'clock the following morning. And it was like a whole day early and we already thought that we were kind of late getting there. So anyway, we still had a lot of miles to paddle and the only portage of the trip was still to come. So we got to the portage trail about nine o'clock at night. So we're portaging all this gear, I mean heavy gear, over this two kilometer portage. This is 10 o'clock at night. That's looking, so this is called um, the Bloody Falls of the Copper Mine. So it's not really falls, it's three big sets of rapids. Um, they were named by, um, um, what's, who was Hearn. Yes, by Hearn, that's right. Um, there was a, who witnessed uh, his, um, his Chippewan guides massacred a group of Inuit that were camped there. This is a very traditional area. Anyway, I, I think there's some controversy as to the authenticity of that, but they still call it the Bloody Falls. So normally this is completely not runnable, but friends of our daughter actually paddled this river this summer on their own, and they paddled their canoes through here. Um, Matt and Connor talked about paddling 
the canoes through unloaded that decided because it was a commercial trip and they were the guides, they probably shouldn't do that. So, <laughs> But thankfully, the four young guys actually portaged the canoes. So the portage didn't finish until 1.30 at night. And we were up again at four the next morning to be on the water for six to paddle to Kaglaktak. So it was a very long day. But our last morning was beautiful. So those sunny pictures were from the last morning. And there's a several hour paddle into Kaglaktak. So there's Bob's last day in the stern of the kayak canoe. And we got to paddle for about a kilometer on the Arctic Ocean, which was pretty thrilling for me because I wanted to go there for so long. We did have a swim too, but I didn't get a picture of it. And I had a real surprise because I ran into Freya Hoffmeister. Um, for those of you that don't know, she's the woman that's paddling around North America. And I did get to paddle with her for five weeks in Baja in 2020. So we were only in town for a matter of hours and our paths crossed, so that was pretty cool. And we were on the second flight out of town, so we got to wander around. So this is Main Street in Kaglaktak. And I had to put this in because I wanted to point out, we went to the co-op and bought a few snacks. Oops. Ah, my big thumb. Note the price of the chocolate bar and then the apple. <laughs> that apple actually came home to Victoria with me. I looked at it for a while before I decided, am I going to eat a $10 apple? But <laughs> I couldn't eat it. <laughs> it was just, yeah. And that's the village of Kaglaktek. And we were flying out again on those um, turbo otters or beavers, Bob? I always forget. Otters. <laughs> so we flew back um, to... So I think I forgot to say or maybe I did that, we had to actually leave a day early. Yeah. So this was all arranged, um, our transportation out of there was arranged by the Yellowknife government during the evacuation of Yellowknife and many towns in the Northwest Territories due to the fires. So there was no evidence of fires anywhere we were other than the bonfires we made. But anyway, we still had to get evacuated. So this was our evacuation flights out to um, Great Bear Lake Lodge where we spent the night. And then the following day, we got back on the planes again, and they took us down to Yellowknife. And so this is just a picture of the fires in the Northwest Territories as we were flying over them. So they took us to Yellowknife, and then we spent a bunch of hours at a school, and then a bunch of hours at the airport, and then there was another big plane evacuation down to Calgary. And we flew home later that night, so it made for a very long couple of days. And... Oh, the slide's not there. Huh. What slide was it? Was the one of your, um, um, the, the graph of the water level, oh. and then my summary slide, but anyway, that doesn't matter. So, No, nope, that's not no, there. No. Okay. Well, I'll just. So, um, Bob has a friend that's a hydrologist, and he was talking to him after the trip, and he did a little bit of research. Um, the fellow's name's Alan Chapman. I don't know if any of you know him, but um, they've been monitoring the water level in the Copper Mine River since 1987, and our water levels this year were 45 percent lower than the previous. Um, than the median, and 20% lower than the previous low ever. So, I mean, this was a really low water level year. So, you know, it was that low water level. So we had a lot of challenges on the trip. You know, the, the low water level ended up, we also were three days upriver from where we were supposed to put in. So that added three days onto the trip that was already shortened by a day for leaving. Um, and the, the weather generally was not very good. And anyway, but we had a great group. Um, it was really, it was a bucket list thing for us and we crossed that off. And yeah, it was really thrilling going down those rapids. I tend to be kind of be a nervous Nelly often kayaking, but I don't know, the rapids didn't make me nervous. It was just fun. <laughs> and yeah, so it was, you know, type two fun, but we have great memories, so. Questions? Bob might be better at answering some of them. No, no capsizing. Um, there was one, one capsize. 
on a, just on a rock in the river. It wasn't anywhere. It's, it's the things that you plan for. In kayaking, it works the same way. The things you plan for usually go really well. It's the things that you don't plan for. So we were just going along the river. There was a lot of rocks to avoid because of the low water level, and they just hit the rock at the wrong angle, and over they went. So, yeah. So I don't know if you got it, but in this, on the trip, we were always under pressure to get to the end because once you're on the river, there, there was no way off it. And, and so the part, it started right well, it started with low water. You know, we, there was the expectation we'd be in flowing water. Um, so we had to overcome the fact that we, for the first week, the water wasn't moving. Uh, the pilot, when he, when, he, when he came in, he wouldn't land where they normally land. So he landed three days upriver. So we, we had three additional days on the trip. Um, plus, we didn't have water flow in the first week. So that's what made this, um, in the second last day, telling us that we we were going to end the day early, really just killed our spirits. But Elizabeth's right, the camaraderie of the group was fantastic. And the guides, you can kind of get the flavor of the guides. They were just- They were they, excellent. They, they were really great fun. guys. And, yeah. and um, so it, it was quite a, a challenge for all of us to overcome, to, to get to the end. And I assume if you would have went in early June, the water would be as, as warm as turkey then, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I Might so. have been higher. But as we were, you know, that big plane when we first stopped, there was a set of, um, um, uh, what's the other company that does the trip? Uh, Black, Black Feather. Feather. Yes. There was a Black Feather trip that was coming off, and they'd had almost, they'd had 25 to 30 degree weather almost the entire time. Wow. <laughs> So when we got there, the guy said, welcome to the first day of fall, uh, <laughs> and it was. So are you serious canoeists from way back who also kayak? We did quite a bit of canoeing. That's, I met Bob in a canoe, and we did some canoe lessons when they did it, and you know, we canoed the Spatsy's to Keene, we canoed the Nahani, but then we had children, and <laughs> Things go south. We moved to Victoria. And we moved to Victoria, and we tried to go to the commute. We took our canoes out to the broken group and went, oh, this is the wrong vehicle. <laughs> and that's when we took up kayaking. Yeah. So, do, does anybody go on those trips that never canoe? This trip, probably not. Um, Actually, two I, of my friends did. It was never canoe before. Yeah. They, yeah, there, there was two the, people on the trip that hadn't canoed before, but one of them, I mean, they were, they were very fit and... Daniel, yeah. the fellow from Australia, had only been a canoe a couple times. I mean, they say you're supposed to be an intermediate canoeer, mm -hmm. but I don't know, some, somehow they let him on. And Nicholas, the fellow that did, had, had not done much canoeing either, but, you know, he'd done some with his parents. He was a good dog. But how, how did he compare to the Nahani as a, a challenge? Um, well, it was, it, was it was many years ago that we did the Nahani, yeah. and it was not a guided trip. It was just us and friends. There was deep water on the Nahani. Yeah, when it was did. much more. Flat. I would say the waves bigger were bigger on the Nahani, but they were, you know, and confined into those the various canyons along the way. It was um, the rocks that were a challenge yeah. on this trip, yeah. um, and the the lack the of moving water, water when it's supposed to be moving that was the challenge. And the other yeah. the other question would be when when we did. Up the way up north, the lack of darkness was a real problem for my body. We hardly slept most of the trip because it was, you just couldn't get used to the fact that there was the sun never went down. Yeah. How did you handle that? Well, by the end of August, 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 it wasn't too so, bad. Yeah. You know, it, it did get pretty 11 dark. 11 o'clock, it would be getting oh. dark. Yeah. 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 So. But I just wear a buff over my eyes. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that seems right. Yes? Uh, <laughs> very expensive. I knew <laughs> I knew somebody would ask. Yes, it is eleven thousand dollars, and you know most of that is because of the flights in and out. Like we've been looking at this for a few years, and we thought about you know getting our own flights in and out. We were going to do the Horton River, which is another one that goes into the Arctic, and like that was going to be twenty thousand dollars worth of flights just for Bob and I to do it. So, you know this. That's what eleven thousand dollars. No, that's each. That's each. Yes, no, that's a very yeah. expensive trip. And it's really gone up in the last 10 years because of the cost of flying. 
Um, I mean, the pilot said that, well, it was seven or eight years ago, they wouldn't let them fly with the canoes on the outside, and they had to put the canoes inside, so that really put up the cost of flying. And in the last few years, I think they spent about, the company spent about $100,000 convincing Transport Canada that they actually could fly with the canoes on the outside, which they've been doing for like 25 years. So, you know, that cost that they spent also put up the cost of flights. So it's the flights that really add up. If you look at the company's other trips that only have one flight, you know, into somewhere, they're much more reasonable. And the next time they're doing this in 2025, they're actually having to fly out of Norman Wells, that um, the big plane that we took to Great Bear Lake Lodge, apparently they're not letting them do that anymore, or the company, the other company, it's not working out. So they're flying from Norman Wells and the cost is up to $14,000. So I don't know how many people will get doing it. I mean, this was a bucket list trip for us. Spending with children's inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> Where the name comes from? There's a deposit of copper uh, near the end, and there, there has been small mines off and on. Yeah. Um, over and the I years. did find a little wee rock this big with little specks of copper in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. there were knives there were and whatnot. That's where the name Yellow Edge comes yes. from. Yes. Knives made of copper. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, okay. So, oh, okay. Okay. long distance between Yellow Edge and Copper Mine, but that's where the name yeah. came from. Okay. Good. Cool. Well, Jake? Like that was did they ever find your luggage? Yes, yes. They <laughs> found it a few days later and they sent it back to my brother, so it was waiting for me when I got so home. So she got an in reach message asking where she wanted her luggage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you get a parachute for all the gear you had? To I did. Yes, I, we spent about $2,500. I mean, I had to yeah. rent a dry suit. It was leaky as anything, but you know, it was $500 just to rent the dry suit. You know, jackets, various stuff. So the WestJet reimbursed me seventeen hundred. So, yeah, I'm still trying to wiggle some more yeah. out of the insurance, but it's not going very far. <laughs> yeah. Like out of the temperature, we were there day and night. Went from what to what? Um, the temperature during the daytime was probably ten degrees. Like it was not warm. It was cold. It, it wasn't that much difference between. I mean, on a sunny day. Yeah, it, it's not. It's similar to here. We get up to 15, like in the spring and the fall here. It's kind of that sort of temperature. We didn't have 15 very often. We always had hats and tubes on. <laughs> was it August two weeks? Yeah, yeah. It was the last two weeks of August. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was. It was definitely fall. Yeah. I, I noticed there seemed to be quite a lot of wind. Yes. Yeah. Is that normal, or did you just have that? Happen? There was. It was bad luck with the wind, and I think it was the north winds. It was actually, I think it went all down the territories, and that's what just blew all the smoke to yellow knife and fanned all the fires, because the fires really picked up after we were on the river. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. like there yeah, was exactly. only the one day that there was bugs, <laughs> so they were either frozen or blown away. <laughs> anyway, great. Oh, one more. No we didn't see any bears. Yeah, we didn't see any bears. No, yeah. no. We saw wolves twice, yeah. but they were always way in the distance. So there's no picture of the wolves. And they were white, the wolves. Yeah, the white wolves. You can see them moving along the top of a ridge. The guide's yeah. story was that the white ones tend to be lone wolves, and the other wolves are black, and they tend to be in packs. I don't know why there would be a color difference, but uh, there seem to be two types of, kind of like the resident orcas and the non residents here, they have different behavior. I don't think we ever even saw any bear sign. I don't think so either. No. 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 Good. Well, thanks so much for listening to my. <laughs>Um, before I thank um, our presenters tonight, there's just something else I forgot to mention. I want to share it with you. Um, and David's going to hate me for saying this, but I know I'm an old friend of his parents. I knew them from back in the 70s when we were all hippies. And um, I promised David's mother that he would make enough money here tonight so that he could go home and see her at Christmas. So if you guys don't buy enough books from him, she's going to just go up one side of me and down. <laughs> so 
His books are still on the table, seriously. Um, they are worth uh, taking a look at. If you haven't had a, a look, taken a look at them before the meeting, please do afterwards, and he's agreed to stick around for a minute or two. Um, tonight's was the first time we've ever done a double presentation, and how did it go? Did you guys like it? <laughs> If the opportunity comes up in the future, we might do that again. Okay. We had two very completely different stories, tonight, and I thought they bookend really well with us and our audience. So I really want to thank um, both of the presenters for the experiences they shared with us. Not only entertaining, but educational, or just an adventure in, in every separate way. So I've got um, two of the much sought after, but hardly ever received a Cisco log. Um, Bob and Elizabeth have done um, a presentation before, so now they have a match set. That's pretty special. <laughs> well, you know, that means you're going to have to come back and do another presentation. Yeah, yeah. And Camille gets the other one. So, um, in, in, uh, Coming up in, um, well, there's no uh, meeting in December because we have a Christmas party, but in January, um, We've got Scott McDonald. He finished, um, he canoed from um, Port Townsend up to Alaska and the race to Alaska in 19 days. We went to see his presentation at uh, Best Coast and um, his best day was over 100 kilometers. He averaged 60 kilometers a day and that's the average considering that, that they took a couple of days off because of weather to do that. There were three of them um, that kind of started paddling together. He was in a, in a kayak. One was in a surf ski, and the, and the third one was in a sup, a paddleboard. Um, and the paddleboard didn't make it, but the two kayaks did. So um, it's, an, it's an adventure not to be missed out in January. And um, David has agreed to come back in March and, and do a presentation to talk about his book. So. Um, if we don't see you at the Christmas party, see you out in the water. Um, hopefully we'll see you back in January. Thank you. Good night.